Oh hi, I'm the heretic. A question I get asked a lot is how would courts work without the state? Would there even be a rule of law? Now I mean we can't address the court problem without addressing the law, so how would it work? Much like the military question, if their contention against adopting a voluntary society free from forced association and coercion is doubt as to how courts the law would work, then that's great! They acknowledge that the state is a parasite on society, that the state is in opposition to the interest of individuals and destructive to a culture. Their opposition has nothing to do with any reasoned arguments against applying individualist first principles like self-ownership and property rights consistently. Their opposition is purely consequentialist, which is fine, because the consequences of statism plus law are absolutely freaking terrible. What exactly is a law supposed to do? Set standards for minimal acceptable behavior to establish order and guidelines for peaceful interaction between individuals. Protect rights, and most importantly, they have to be ethically justifiable. Can statist law accomplish this? There's one problem. The state violates your rights. Property rights through taxation, which pays for murder through abortion and undeclared wars. If you don't like it, you can't legally disassociate from the state. The idea that the state protects people's rights, or how the First Amendment of the United States Constitution protects the people's right to freely associate, is absolutely ludicrous. If you try to resist, they throw you into a cage. Theft? Murder? Kidnapping? Selling weapons to criminals and terrorists? Failing to properly secure classified documents? If the government's own law were applied consistently within its area of jurisdiction, there would be no government. To say nothing of how they describe things that are perfectly ethically justifiable as crimes. So not only does it not protect your rights, but it doesn't even provide a minimum standard of acceptable behavior. It applies at least two. You see, you're not allowed to steal 30% of people's income, but when the state does it, that's just taxation. Under statism, law has a double standard. Rules for ye, not for me. Even if you're willing to overlook this, there's still a problem. The legislators, whether they be a democratic parliament or a single monarch, still do not have the right incentives for good rulemaking. Sets of crappy rules made in a free market would dissuade people from associating with the rulemaker. For example, if your birthday party's dress code only allows people to wear Italian tuxedo jackets and skirts made out of banana leaves, who's going to attend? This failure signals that the rule sucks. Legislators can force people to attend that birthday party and thus can't receive these vital signals. And this is not a question about personal preference. These laws can codify significant economic inefficiency. For example, if we kept regulations in the United States the same since World War II, as in not a single new regulation law was added, subtracted, or changed, the United States would have a GDP three times what it is today. What kind of society have we missed out on? What innovations could we have had? How many lives could have been saved with the medical technology that might have existed but for the temporary legislators' rapacious lust for control and power? Clearly, status law is absolutely terrible. What about the courts, though? Oh, do you mean the same status courts that take two years to decide that Count Dankula owes 800 pounds in fines for a video? The same status courts that ordered Alfie Evans to die in a hospital because the judge personally disliked the family's attorney? The same status courts that said Philip Brailsford didn't do nothing? Status courts are such bastions of law, justice, and integrity. Come on, you think I'm stupid? The same problems of not being subject to market competition and being insulated from the concerns of customers apply to statist courts. Of course they're going to be awful. But what alternatives are there? How do we protect people's rights without the pitfalls of statist law? This should go without saying, but yes, there would be rules under voluntarism. Standards of behavior will be enforced and consequences will be given out for violating them. People will also still have disputes. People have had disputes for centuries, 
and they've been able to resolve these disputes in their interpersonal relationships without the state. As for crime, it'll continue to exist. Thus, people will want to protect their persons and property. This can be done through crime insurance. People would subscribe, and in the event of a crime, it'd pay the client the cost of the damages. Thus, crime insurance is incentivized to mitigate the instances of crime for their clients, and will hire private police to patrol their clients' areas and neighborhoods. After all, crimes that are stopped or deterred are fewer payouts. When crimes do happen, these insurance companies will investigate to find the culprit. After all, a criminal who escapes justice will almost certainly do it again, which means more payouts. The insurance companies might do it themselves or outsource it to private investigators. Once a suspect is found, the suspect's own insurance company and the victim will negotiate on what private court they want to adjudicate their case. The victim will want a court favorable to him, and the suspect wants a favorable court too. Their interests will necessarily meet in the middle, and they'll seek out an impartial judge. The only way courts would therefore be able to make money is to have as many court cases as possible, and the way they do that, the way they attract customers, is to hire fair and impartial judges who are scholars of the law. If the suspect has their own criminal insurance agency, they might even launch their own investigation, as litigation is costly. If they find that their client is guilty, they'll encourage their client to make a settlement. If their findings contest that of the victim's insurance company, then they can present those findings, as the victim's insurance company is incentivized to find the real culprit. If either company can't reach a mutually agreeable solution, then this is going to be hashed out in court. These courts will use restorative justice instead of punitive. If you steal a bike, then you should return the bike, plus the cost of the investigation in the courts. If the criminal cannot do this financially, then they could go into debt and pay it off, maybe through levies on their paycheck, or through jobs or asset forfeiture. If they refuse, then society would punish them through the vastly underrated mechanism of blacklisting. Put simply, criminals won't be in prison, but businesses won't want to associate with a known criminal who refuses to pay their debts. What this means is that nobody will sell them food. Their houses won't be supplied with water or electricity. They might be fired from their job, and landlords will refuse to rent with them. Their bank assets will be frozen. While this won't guarantee criminals won't be able to buy goods or services, those that do sell to them can do so at a tremendous markup. As in, $50 for a gallon of milk markup. After all, where else is he going to go? What criminal justice will do in a free, voluntary society is put an actual price on criminality. One, criminals will be incentivized to pay, else society will collectively disassociate itself from them. If all else fails, and the insurance company is unable to come up with a culprit to pay the cost of the damages, then the insurance company will have to give the payout to their clients themselves. This is a far more fair and more just way of applying a consistent law. Now let's address some of the criticisms that will doubtlessly be leveled. Won't rich people just buy out the courts? Not if the courts want to continue having business. Both parties have to agree for a court to adjudicate a case, and if one of them insists on a bought and paid for kangaroo court, not only can we conclude that they aren't arguing a case in good faith, but that said court won't be receiving any money in the future except through its rich sugar daddies, which isn't sustainable for either side. The incentive for courts is to be fair and apply the law consistently rather than succumb to the rampant double standards of status law. Would criminals agree to a court at all? Of course. It's the quickest way to not be blacklisted by society. What if the law says free speech is wrong? Law isn't codified by legislators, but applied defensively, in terms of what people cannot do to you or your property. Good luck arguing that in non-status courts that you've been harmed by words. No insurance company would cover hurt feelings, and no reputable judge would even entertain your case. How are judges selected, and how do we know they're good? The hiring practices of private courts will vary, 
but as they want as many cases as possible, the only way they can do that is by having a reputation for honesty, integrity, and impartiality. So no judges with pussy hats, ever. What if the poor can't afford crime insurance? In the absence of taxation, I genuinely can't believe there won't be some form of crime insurance program that even the poor can't afford. For example, there were fraternal societies in the very early 20th century, which cost like 25 cents a month, and that's after adjusting for inflation. It not only paid for health insurance, but life insurance. I can't believe something similar wouldn't exist for crime insurance. But even assuming that they couldn't afford it, I cannot believe charitable organizations won't exist to compensate and seek justice on behalf of victims down on their luck, or that watchdog groups won't be looking for any opportunity to expose underhandedness, such as abusing the system against poor people. Now who would pay for crime insurance? Businesses who want their assets protected and their customers feeling secure. Individuals who want to protect their families. Homeowners associations or copy and community covenants who want to protect their residents. Use your imagination. Won't private police only deal with the crimes of their subscribers? Their customers want the whole area as crime free as possible. If they let some crimes go, then they aren't doing their job. Also. Wouldn't stopping crime for a non-subscriber just be good PR? But won't that mean that people benefit from a private police even if they don't pay for it? This is known as the free rider problem, and yes, it would happen, but so what? A crime-free neighborhood benefits everybody. If it really was a concern, then some businesses may offer discounts to crime insurance subscribers if only to incentivize it. Are there any examples in history of stateless courts? Ancient Ireland had Brennan Law, where the eponymous Brennans were the impartial judges who mediated over disputes in private courts called Tuatha. Medieval Europe had Merchants Law, where businesses blacklisted known criminals. And even today, we have private arbitrators who adjudicate cases, as the government courts take too damn long. How do we know they'll be good? Because unlike the state, people are free to not pay for crime insurance or private police if they aren't doing their job. Thus, the onus is on the insurance companies to make customers want to pay for them. And the only way they do that is providing a service people want. If they don't, then they get outcompeted by a business that will. The state needs to do none of these things. They don't answer to customers, suffer from the economic consequences of their stupid decisions, and receive all the money they need, whether they serve people's needs or not. So to answer the question, how would a stateless, voluntary, and narco-capitalist run courts and law? Better than a state ever could. Questions? Comments? Critique? How would you hire judges if you owned a private court? What would you name your private court? Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.